Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We are going to talk to you about event submission and running events for Gen Con Online. A lot of you are very likely familiar with Gen Con already. You may have attended the show in the past. You may have submitted events or participated in them in the past. And for an online convention, uh, a lot of those details, a lot of those forms are going to be very similar. The process is going to be very similar. But there are some very important changes and tweaks that we want to make sure that we highlight and explain to everybody before they go through the process and try to set up their events. So we'll talk through how to submit an event, um, some things that you want to keep in mind when running a game online that are different from running a game in person. And we're going to talk about some of the platforms that you might want to explore when you're trying to figure out how you might want to run your particular game online or other events, actually. We're not just going to be talking about games. Um, but let's introduce the team first. I am Derek Guter. I'm the Senior Event and Program Manager at Gen Con. Dominic Lewis is our event coordinator. Marion McBride is our event manager. And the boss of all of us is Jeanette Legault. She is the Senior Director of Event Programming at Gen Con. So, so why don't we just take a moment for everyone to talk about what some of their responsibilities are. Marion, do you want to go first, maybe? Sure. Um... At the show, uh, Gen Con Indie, I'm normally in charge of a lot of the non-gaming programming. So that's going to be seminars and workshops. Uh, some of the tracks, uh, it's going to be spa, puppet, MHE, that kind of thing. Uh, kids, and some miscellaneous things. Uh, so there's some overlap with gaming, but it's mostly the non-gaming stuff. Okay. Dominic, how about you? Yeah, so um, actually Derek and I kind of split duties a little bit on um, your general gaming events, um, event types mostly. So the RPGs, your LARPs, your uh, board games, etc. cetera. Uh, on site, I also uh, am in charge of uh, first exposure playtest hall and film programs um, at Gen Con as well. And then, um, you know, something we'll not be doing, but I'm also in charge of rented space and, and all that kind of process as well. So moving into an online world, not having to do that, that's a huge chunk um, out of that world, since which we'll talk about a little bit more, is obviously we don't have to place anything physically. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We get to tackle this process in a virtual sense. Great. And then Jeanette, uh, she handles a lot of special events, particularly like guests, uh, artists and authors, industry insiders, uh, stuff like that. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of if you email <coughs> events at .com, who you might end up um speaking with depending on kind of what you come in dominic is often the on the front lines to receive those emails and then route them to the appropriate course person um, but if you have a particular question you're also more than welcome to reach out to any of us individually so why don't we uh talk about the event submission process overall so if you haven't submitted an event to gen con before you will fill out an event submission form. It's going to ask you some very basic information, the description, the title, the time you want to run it, what game you're running, um, uh, who's going to be running it, things like that. The time that you prefer, how much you want to charge. You'll submit that to us on a form. We'll review it. Uh, we might make changes to it if we anticipate that uh, not as many people will show up as you're optimistically hoping there will be because we have historical information. We might reduce it. Um, we might reach out to you um, and say that the time that you want to do it um, doesn't work for us. Can we shift the time a little bit? Um, we might have to adjust the game system that you entered to have it match up with how other people have entered that game system or what the official title is, quote unquote. Um, so that whole process is a little bit of a back and forth, but fundamentally, you will submit the event to us. It'll be listed as submitted for review in your online dashboard where you can always go check the status. Once we have reviewed it, if we think that it, we get all the, got all the information that we need to be able to you know, finalize it, to place it, to make it active, and let attendees view it and get tickets for it. Then we'll mark it as accepted for consideration until we make the final sweep through to activate stuff. So if there was a problem of any kind, if we had a, a question for you, if there was something that we couldn't figure out, then we'll return it for correction. And the, the ball is kind of back in your court. And then you need to review the event, figure out what you want to change, and then resubmit it. Um, this process can kind of go back and forth depending on how complicated an event is. And, you know, if you're ever confused during that process, just email events at GenCon.com and say, hey, um, I got an event returned to me. I, I don't understand what you want me to fix. Everything seems okay to me. And then we're happy to kind of go into detail on it. But then once an event is um, accepted, eventually uh, it will be activated. And then the attendees can see it and they can get tickets to it. And you're, you're good to go. You just need to show up to wherever you're going to run it. Um, and help the players have a good time. 
Um, there's a couple other statuses. Like if you need to cancel an event, you need to delete something, you accidentally created something, we can mark that as canceled. You can't just email us to request. And in some rare cases, we might decide that an event is just not suitable for Gen Con. Um, you know, it's just not going to work for whatever reason. It's not the kind of event we want. And we may just mark that as rejected, which means that you should not resubmit that without emailing us and mm, finding out why we rejected it, basically. Uh, do any of you, either of you, have anything you want to add to that kind of general process? No, I just think um, the sentiment of keeping track of your events. So once you've submitted your event and your job isn't isn't done, um, it, it will go through that review process and you're responsible for keeping track of any changes we make um, or things we add to it or, or alter in any case, as well as what status that event is in. Um, particularly if something is returned back to you for correction, as Derek mentioned, make sure that you read what's there. And if you have a question, email us. Um, and if you can solve the problem, then submit the event again. Um, but just keep on top of that. And you can always access that through the EOGM dashboard um, that you have access to by logging in on Gen Con, to your Gen Con account. Anything you want to add, Mary? No. Great. Sounds great. So, uh, one of the other kind of differences with Gen Con Online, at least for this year, uh, to normal Gen Con is that everything is obviously happening on a much tighter timeline. Um, you know, due to the cancellation and the adjustment, things are going to move a little faster than they normally would. And what that means is event submission opens on Monday, June 8th, and event registration, when attendees are going to be able to purchase tickets to events, is on July 13th. Um, and the event schedule should be made public to people so they can see it and decide what they want to register for about a week prior to that. So what that means is you have about a month-ish to have everything, um, the schedule that you want in the system completed, done, and ready to be public, you know, in about a month. Um, and that means that you probably want to get your event details into us within the next like two or three weeks after that June 8th um, uh, launch date. So if you want to make sure that your stuff is ready to go when the initial schedule release comes out to attendees, Try to make sure that you have everything that you feel you need to get into the system in by the end of June at the absolute latest. Anything after that, we will still look at, we'll still accept, we'll still process as quickly as we yeah. have the opportunity to do so. Um, but we uh, we can't really make any promises. Yep. Yeah, it's just, um, it's, it's really important, just what Dominic said, to keep on top of your submission status, even more so this year, just because we're on such a tight uh, timeline. And when you see something returned for correction, get on it and correct it right away or, or contact us right away so that we can move it along as fast as possible. We don't want to delay your event coming out either. Now, that said, as before, we'll, we'll, we'll be activating events after registration opens. But of course, we want as many events to go live when registration opens to attendees as possible. So yep. you got to help us yep. Yep. help you. <laughs> You'll get the maximum exposure for your event if you make sure that you are in the system early enough to be part of that first schedule release. Um, there are certain attendees, like plenty of attendees, will still look at late events, but uh, a, you know, a non-insignificant number will register based off of what they see first. They'll fill up their weekend, and they won't really have a need to go back to the schedule to check again. So why don't we look at some of the actual pages and tools that you can use on the website to do some of this. So first, uh, remember that anything you might need or that you know we're aware that you'll need to run your events with regards to Gen Con documentation and whatnot is available on the host page. So if you go to GenCon.com and you click on this button here, just click on host, it will load this page. This has the timeline, all the dates, it has the links to all the important documents and forms and information you might need. It has a brief summary on how to submit events, and it has a link to the video for uh, event submission, um, the form you know, that we usually use during the rest of the show. And important here is the event host policy. This is going to give you all the nitty gritty rules that you need to keep in mind when you're submitting events. We also have uh, best practices for running events uh, or attending events online. And that's going to give you a lot of things to keep in mind if you're not used to running events online. Third-party platforms is an initial list that we have put together with some very, very basic information on different software 
uh, applications or websites or platforms that may be helpful in you figuring out how you want to run your game online if you're uh, not already kind of uh, used to doing so. And then we have the EO and GM forum if you have any questions. And if you're not already signed up already, make sure to sign up for the EO GM email list so that you'll get notifications for whenever policies change or new things are announced or dates are released or things like that. Um, let us go to the submission form now, unless either of the two of you have anything else that you want to add. Nope, I, I just want to clarify too that, you know, there we've tailored the website currently so that um, it is ha sharing that information that is focused on Gen Con online. There are some legacy pieces of information that might still be out there that are helpful in a certain capacity, but those would be mostly referencing a, the physical convention. Um, so just note that those links that Derek walked through there are tailored to help you in the process of submitting events and running events for Gen Con online, um, including the, the updated event host policy. And because this is a new process for all of us this year and in incorporating an online convention with online events, uh, we strongly, strongly encourage do your research and read thoroughly um, these documents in advance of submitting your events so that you are fully prepared to be able to put together a, an event that's going to be successful and is going to be approved by us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will warn you that watching this video or having run events at Gen Con in the past is not uh, a substitute for actually reading the new policies. Yes. There are enough things that are different that you're going to want to make sure you read through it. We're going to try to hit the high points here, but not necessarily everything. Also, it's uh, good to know that the event host policy is a lot smaller this year. <laughs> So, you know, we've had complaints that it's a lot to read through. It's much smaller this year. I promise you can get through it 10, 15, 20 minutes tops. So please read it. We spend a lot of time on it and we do that for a reason. We want to make sure that you guys are fully prepared for your events. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to reiterate it again, if you have any questions, if something seems unclear, or if you have an idea of something that you would like to do that you don't see a way to accomplish in what we have outlined, then just drop us an email at events at gencon.com. Let us know what you're thinking of doing, and we can talk through how we might be able to fit that um, in our structure, basically. We're here to try to help figure out how to make your event work, uh, not just explain how our, our system works. We like to do both. So there are three key main differences with GenCon <laughs> Online versus the physical GenCon, and this is mainly for folks who are used to running a lot of events. Um, but it's worth kind of uh, calling out very specifically. First, um, all events at for Gen Con Online that would normally have a price at physical Gen Con, and this would be things like playing a game, uh, attending a workshop, things like that. The price for those events is just simply a flat $2, no matter the duration of that event. So even if you have a six hour event, it's still the Gen Con base price is only $2. Um, yeah, that is uh, that's very different from the normal because it would normally be two dollars per increment of two hours. So a six-hour you know mini tournament would normally have a six-dollar base price. Now it just is a flat two-dollar base price. When you submit your event, the system will not automatically calculate that properly. We will have to manually adjust it on the back end. So if you submit a long event and it has a price higher than you anticipated, don't worry about it yet. We we'll give us a chance to go through and update it and then it should adjust back down to where you were expecting it to be. Second, the platform field, which is basically the location field that we would use uh, at the physical convention is now gonna be directly editable by the event organizer. And this is where you're gonna put in whatever software your players need to connect to your game. It could be something like Tabletop Simulator. It could be something like Roll20 and Zoom because you're gonna use Zoom for uh, audiovisual, you know, if you, know, you can chat so you can see your players, but you can use Roll20 for the battle map. It could be just Zoom because you're gonna have your players connect to it and you're gonna run Fantasy Grounds on your local computer to control the battle map. And you're gonna move all the minis on behalf of the players and they're just gonna tell you where to go, in which case they only need Zoom. So that's something that you can edit directly. Um, you can put in just about anything you want there, but we are gonna edit that to match up to standards of what other people are editing so that it's very clear to, to attendees. Um, but there's no strict limit on where a game needs to be run. Um, but if something seems out of place, we certainly will be reaching out to you to get more information. Uh, and then finally, uh, something that we'll go into more detail later is 
a new feature that will be added called the event messaging tool. And this will allow event organizers, GMs, and players of an event to communicate with each other to get into whatever application that they need to get into. So uh, you're not going to want to list the Zoom invite link as the, the platform for your event, because anybody who sees the event will be able to see that link and join, and you won't be able to limit it to just your players. It'll be very hard to kind of maintain a reasonable game and stay focused if anybody could pop in at any time. Um, what you'll instead have is a messaging tool that is just for the people involved in the event that you can use to send invite links, usernames, server passwords, uh, whatever connection information you need to provide to your players to connect to the game, you can send through that system. Um, you'll want to keep in mind that you should only use that system to communicate essential information or ask for essential information to connect to the game. It should not be used for spamming. It should not be used for casual chatter. Um, you can do a lot of that once you actually connect to whatever platform you're going to use to communicate in the game. Um, you know, character creation, stuff like that. Um, you should either include it, whatever information you need players to know in your event submission. Um, you can have the long description. You can have a message to register players for that or you can cover that when people are in the game. The message and tool is primarily to get them into the game uh, very quickly and try to keep that as clean and focused as you can is what we would recommend. Further, uh, if you notice any players who are causing problems, if they're harassing other players, or if they're harassing you, the event organizer, let us know so we can remove them from that because uh, that behavior is not tolerated at Gen Con Online or at physical check Anything else the two of you want to add before we hop into individual fields? Just, just to reconfirm that this, this tool was, is created to help assist in the function of getting your game up and running. Um, it's a way for us to enable a possibility um, for the EOs, GMs, and the registered players for the event to speak confidentially. And that should be the space that you use that to set that up. So you don't need to be worrying about other people popping in, um, to Derek's point. Um, and you don't need to worry about trying to convey that weeks in advance, that this tool is, is to be used um, in the run up to the actual event taking place um, so that everybody has a central place to go um, that is private and connected to their Gen Con account. Mm -hmm. And that you can also use it if you have to, to convey information critical to the game. So for instance, if you plan to run 10th edition of Gamma World and it's not gonna come out anymore, so now you have to run fifth edition or whatever. Even though you know we prefer that all that to be in the event description, if there's something critical that would affect the gameplay, you can use it for that. But you should primarily just be using it to set up the means by which you guys will be able to connect and talk further. Mm -hmm. Great, so why don't we look at the actual submission form itself. Um, and I'm gonna go to the staging website. Um, so you should see it now. Uh, and this is where um, submission is actually already open. Um, event submission should open for everybody on Monday, June 8th, I believe at noon Eastern. Yes. So um, as you can see, the form is not super long. Um, there are a few notes that we're gonna have uh, where we wanna talk about how a particular field is very different. But if you're used to submitting events at Gen Con, most of this is gonna be very, very straightforward. So just to talk through and walk through individual fields uh, very, very quickly. We have the gaming group and company field. This is where you're going to enter the name of your company, your gaming group, or whatever organization you're running events with. Um, each organization should only have one person submitting their events, all of their events. Um, but if you're, you know, this works fine if you're a company. It works fine if you're a group of friends who just kind of have a banner you want to organize stuff um, together under. Uh, if you are not part of a group, do not put anything in that field. Don't put none, don't put NA, don't put independent. None of those things apply. You can leave it blank. As you notice, it is not listed as a required field. Uh, a required field that is here is the event title. Uh, um, can I just say, yep, for, I'm sorry, for the game group company, sorry to interrupt. Um, yes, also, please. please please just don't put your name in there because I have to take yes. that out a lot. If you want to make, if your name is Bob and you want to make a gaming group, I mean, just Bob's games or something, it's fine. Just don't call it Bob because mm -hmm. it, aside from causing confusion in our system, it just, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Um, so it's totally okay, like he said, to leave it blank. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. You also, um, just to be clear, people also ask me how you make a gaming group and how you make a gaming group. Just to reiterate, you just say you're, you're a gaming group and you put that name in there. You can make up whatever you want and it's totally fine. Uh, you don't have to declare to us in advance that you're a gaming group or what have you. So feel free because we love it when you group stuff together. Uh, that helps us more efficiently go through your events because then we only have one point of contact. Um, but yes, feel free to make a gaming group and it can be a gaming group of just one. But if you're not interested, please just leave it blank and please don't put your name. Yep. Makes and uh, make sure that if you do make a gaming group that only one person is submitting on behalf of that group. Absolutely, yes. Ones. Yes. Great. So for the event title field, this is really just what your event is going to be called. Um, and this is a pretty straightforward self-evident field, except for events or games that have scenarios or adventures or um, something beyond just the rules. And this usually applies specifically to like the LARPs and RPGs and games where you would play an adventure. Um, so for example, if you're going to run a D&D game, if you're going to run Tomb of Horrors, your event title would be Tomb of Horrors. It would not be Dungeons and Dragons Tomb of Horrors. Um, that's for the game system. The For games that don't have scenarios, that don't have any kind of thing like that, um, like you're just going to play Dominion, it's okay to repeat the game system in the event title. Um, but if you are doing anything weird with the Dominion, like if you have a special scenario or you're using... Um, a pre-built combination of decks or um, of cards uh, for a particular feel for the game, then feel free to use that in your explanation of what the title is. Um, be creative because this is where people this is the first thing people are going to see about your event. And if you're just concerned with them finding the game, there's a separate field for that, so you don't need to worry about replicating it here. Similarly, the short description is where you're going to explain what the actual game play is going to be, like what you're going to do. If it's an adventure, this is where you would explain like what the adventure is going to be about. Um, what are you going to go do? Uh, What's going to be covered? What are players going to do? If it's a game, uh, like a board game or a card game or something like that, this is your opportunity to give a very quick summary of what the game is like or why players should be interested in it if they didn't already know about it. If it's Already, if it's really only for people who are already super familiar with the game, you're not trying to get new players in and you just want really experienced players, then you can feel free to have a very short description of what the game is like or really just focus on what is your gameplay going to be like. You know, you can say, hey, this is for hardcore people who are just ready to get into it. Um, if you're running a tournament, this is where you would say we expect this many rounds or this is what the prize is or here are the tournament limitations, things like that. Um, but the short description is your really quick hook that you can try to get a player to pay attention to your game. Um, it's different from the optional long description, which you can see displayed now. Um, just click on that link if you want to use it, because the short description is limited to 200 characters. The long description has 900 characters, and this is where you want to go into a lot more detail. Are you using strange house rules? Um, you know, do you want to give a history of how you've been running this game at Gen Con for 40 years? Um, does it connect to other sessions? Uh, are you combining two different games? Do players need to prepare characters in advance? Um, all that kind of stuff might be something worthwhile going into the long description. This is where you can also talk a little bit about your history or you know, whatever you feel you need to give context for folks um, before they decide whether they want to take it or not. If it doesn't fit in the short description, put it here. If you fit it in the short description, don't put it here because it's already in the short description. You don't need to repeat it. Um, but this is definitely the information you give to somebody after they've said, hey, I'm interested in this. Tell me more. That's what the long description is for. Marion, do you have any different advice that you want to give for any of these fields for seminars or anything like that? Um, not particularly. I think the advice that you gave uh, is about the same. Uh, you just want to make sure that from your brief description, people understand what they'll be talking about or what will be presented. You don't want to, as you said, if you're presenting a seminar on the history of gaming, your short description should not be, it's the history of gaming. You should explain a little bit about, you know, we'll talk about from, from you know, BC games up until the present with a focus on board games, RPGs, or, or something like that, right? You just want people to have 
sort of a good reason to come to your event. You want to have the hook, you know, so, and please do be creative. And, and I, I don't repeat because I do have a lot of people that don't understand that they don't need to repeat the short description in the longer description. So mm -hmm. you really don't need to do that. A good you'll, golden rule for this one. I was just saying, you'll be able to see both the short description and the long description when viewing the event details. So there's, yeah. there's no, no need to duplicate that information. It's only going to further confuse and detract from the message you're trying to convey to pitch your event on uh, to attendees so they register for it. A good golden rule in general for all of your event submission is do not repeat information, period. Um, sure. Yeah. You know, absolutely. Ch chances are there's a field for something like there's a we have the field for gaming group and company name. Don't put it anywhere else. We have the field for game system. Try not to put it anywhere else. There are going to be some cases where you kind of have to deviate from that. Like again, you know, if you're playing a board game, the yeah. title and the game system can be the same. That's okay. Um, if you're not doing anything special or weird, um, I encourage people to do special or weird things. But if you're just if you're just playing it straight up, that's okay. But once you have listed those in those fields, don't do that in the short description. Don't do it in the long description. You don't need to tell me that I'm playing Seven Wonders in the event title, the game system, the short description, and the long description. You've already said it. There's no point in repeating it. You're just kind of wasting your space. Um, other things that you want to keep in mind is do not include links or URLs of any kind in the short description. Um, keep that as entirely plain text. Do not do that. They will be removed. In the long description, we're a little bit more lenient. Um, if you need to link to here or there, sometimes we allow that. However, do not include the link to your online session that you are running. So if you're going to run it in Zoom, do not include the Zoom link info. If you're going to run it in Tabletop Simulator, do not include the server name or the server password when you set that event up and submit it. Do not do that because then you will not be able to control who accesses your, your event. Uh, so the next field is the event type, and this is largely unchanged from uh, physical Gen Con. Um, you can select a variety of different events. Um, there are a few like trade day and stuff like that that we simply will not be running at all this year. Um, so you don't need to submit those. But if you do have an idea for something that you want to do, you can always reach out to us. Um, if the event is returned to you for correction or if the event type has changed or anything like that, if you have any questions. Um, some of these different event types will have different kind of variables off of them, like seminar, for example, are always free. Those are kind of just audience presentations to, to people who are going to you know, observe it. Um, whereas workshops might be similar, but they can have a charge and they presume you're going to get some sort of material or that you are going to um, like sit down and kind of come away with, with really in-depth knowledge that you wouldn't get from a simple seminar. Usually there's an expectation of kind of back and forth with the host of some kind. A um, skill if you choose- You learn something yeah. other than just, yeah, being talked at, yeah. If you choose a game type, then the uh, game system and uh, rules edition uh, will appear here and you can type in um, what you're actually going to be running. So this could be, you know, I selected card game here. Um, this could be, um, Seven Wonders, uh, and then I could list, um, you know, Cornucopia Edition, uh, for example, if that's the version that I want to play with folks. And if you're uh, confused by what, where your event, what type of event you are running, where, what category it should go into, right underneath there's a link um, with just some more fleshed out information about what, what we consider each of those categories and how they apply. Um, so that should be your first step if you're trying to uh, figure out between whether your game is a RPG or a LARP or whatnot, um, whatever sort of categories, or, or to the seminar workshop point, that's a great example as well with a lot of confusion sometimes. Check it out, read what, what we say of how we define those categories, and then choose the appropriately. If you have further questions from that, just email us and we'll be able to help you out. Mm -hmm. I think leaping out at me, I believe that uh, kid events and trade day events um, are the two categories of event that we will not have as part of Gen Con Online for this year. Um, there are other types of events like LARPs that are going to be really hard to do, um, but if you have a brilliant proposal um, on how you're going to manage to run a LARP over Zoom, I'd love to hear it. I would love to see that. I'm going to sneak into your Zoom link and watch that. That's going to be great. 
Derek, we're to the rules nope. edition, aren't we? Mm -hmm. I had a question for you about that. Sure. Say I'm running a game and it's the latest edition. Can I just write current there? No, you cannot. Are you sure? Yeah. Does that make you just really annoyed? It does. Uh, yeah. So does original, new, old, mm. latest. Latest. Yeah. Mm, yeah. All like anything that is a relative qualifier is not appropriate for this field. You want to use an exacting and specific rules edition so that somebody who has not kept up knows what you're talking about. So current is not good, but first, second, 20th anniversary, fifth, revised, um, any sometimes of those a date. are appropriate. It can sometimes yep. even be a date if you're, if you're doing, let's say if you're doing Stop Thief. So um, you could, if you're doing the new one by Restoration Games, you would do first or second edition because they have two of them. But if you're doing the old original Milton Bradley one, you might put in the actual year that came out so that people could understand that's the edition you're running. And I think that would be fine. Mm -hmm. Also, do us a favor. If you notice here on the forum, we have the word edition there. Don't type in edition. Um, further, uh, type, uh, don't type out first or second with letters. Just do one ST or two ND. It's okay. Uh, it'll save us from having to change it later. And again, so those are the you, ordinal, you, ordinal numbers is what we want. Yeah. Yep. If you put something in here, avoid putting it in another field. Yeah. Another, another thing too, is like with this aspect of us doing online events, I would assume submitting online as the addition is probably not what we're looking for in that, that right. field. Is that correct? Yeah. Right. Please there's not. No yes. on, there's no online edition for all exactly. these games. No online, no digital stuff like that. Mm -hmm. This is the actual edition mm -hmm. for the game. Unless it is Internet. actually part of the, the name of that game. Like for example, if you want to run an event in Magic the Gathering online, that's the name of the game. That's fine, but if you're running D&D, &D, there's no D&D &D online that is this. Like that's a different game, so don't confuse people. So minimum players and maximum players, um, this is, they should be self-evident. This is just where you enter. The minimum number of players is how many people do you need to show up to be able to run this game? Oh, actually, so, Derek, mm -hmm. I, I would like to interject if you wouldn't mind. Um, sure. I know it's particularly for seminars. Uh, some people seem to think that this is the minimum or maximum number of panelists that mm -hmm. would be attending. And I just want to clarify, no, it's the maximum number of attendees you would like to have at your seminar. I understand mm -hmm. it being online. It's a little hard to say how many maximum you could handle for some, in some platforms. But yeah, it's, it's not one to four. It's going to be 10 to 50, 100, 200, whatever you think. Yep. Thank you, Derek. So, uh, so a couple of things that come out of that. Um, a remember that everything you enter on this form should be attendee facing. So that includes the maximum number of players. You know, no one really cares whether your panel is going to have four panelists, five, two, whatever. They might, you know, want to know who those panelists are, but the number of panelists is unlikely to influence whether they want to attend a particular panel. Or not. So you, this is the number of people, number of attendees that you want tickets to be available for. Um, so minimum number of players is, again, what is the minimum number of participants this event needs to be able to function? And for a seminar, it's probably one. You could still give a seminar to one person. For an RPG, you might need three because your adventure needs three players. Um, you know, there might be board games you now that have a similar limitation. Um, maximum number of players is the maximum number that you want tickets to be available for or that you can accommodate. And for a Gen Con online, this is going to vary fairly significantly. So for a lot of games, there's still going to be a very hard limitation of the GM can only handle so many people at once. The organizer can only coordinate so many players at once. The game can only accommodate so many players, um, depending on the kind of the format of it. But for a seminar or something like that, maybe you're hosting a seminar on your own Twitch channel and you want it listed in our system. Um, set your maximum number of players to 200 or something like that. See how ticket sales go. If the ticket sales fill up and you want to open up more space, feel free to increase it. If you have any experience running seminars for your company or your organization in the past, look at the kind of concurrent viewership you've had in the past and base your number on that. Um, we might um, ask people to justify extremely large numbers, um, but it's more just we want to get some context so that we kind of understand what you're expecting, basically. 
Um, I think that's about it. Uh, it's the only other thing to say is that, you know, if you are running an event um, and you don't get your minimum number of players, part of the reason you entered that is so that folks have a sense of whether there's a risk that the event might be canceled if not enough tickets are sold to it. Um, you're going to want to wait until the start time for your event to see if you can recruit any last minute people. But if you needed four players for your D D game because it's real special and you have to have four players and you can't run it for two and only two show up, then you can cancel it and you can all kind of move on and try to find another game to participate in. The next field is age requirement. And um, this is an informative field for you to tell players what kind of age they need to be to participate and what kind of content might be in that game. So if you are running a game that has a lot of violence in it and you don't want younger players exposed to that, then you need to choose an appropriate age category. Um, again, this is informative. You're gonna be the one who is responsible for actually enforcing it because the system does not authenticate ages. And then further for Gen Con Online, no child under 13, nobody under 13 can participate in the online events. So that means that if you select everyone or kids only for your event submission, then we will either return it to you for correction or adjust it ourselves to what seems appropriate. So keep an eye on that. Um, unfortunately, we can't offer kid only events at this time. Experience required is very similar. This is another um, informative field to players. This is going to be how much time are you going to spend teaching players how to play the game? Um, just be honest with them. You know, if you want to just get people together to play a game that you know well and you want to play with other people who know well, then tell them you're not going to teach them how to play. And then players can self-select out and everyone will be happier because they got the kind of game that they wanted. Um, if you're willing to teach people how to play, then say that. And people who don't want to be in a game with that pacing will know to opt out. But remember, that is something for you to enforce. And then finally, we have materials provided. And this indicates whether or not the players or participants themselves need anything, uh, need to bring anything to the game or session to be able to participate. And, you know, at a physical convention, this could be cards or dice or things like that. Um, for an online convention, you know, do they need to make a character? Do they need to have access to their own rule books? Do they need to have a license for a particular type of software that to connect to your session that you're not able to provide them with in some way or another? Um, Marion, did you want to talk about workshops or something like that? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I know it's trickier. Um, if you, Basically, what we would like you to do for this year, if you're submitting a workshop, that requires any materials, because there, there could be some that don't, uh, you're going to just submit the event without the cost of materials, okay? Um, if it is basic materials that someone needs, so for instance, you're doing origami, they only need scissors and a piece of paper or something like that, great, just list that in the long description. That could also be a place where you might need to clarify that in the event messaging tool, but hopefully you've made that clear in the uh, long description. If they need more complicated, if you're teaching something complicated that needs unusual tools um, so that they might not have at home, you need to provide a link to where they can purchase them. That link can also be to a web store, including your web store. So just to provide a few examples, uh, let's say, again, you're teaching a basic origami class. Uh, you just say, please make sure to have sharp scissors and three pieces of eight by eight paper. That's great, that's all I need. If you're running a knitting class, you can say, please purchase size six knitting needles and have a skein of worsted weight yarn or whatever you need. You can provide them a link to Joann's or any other site that you want. If you are running a workshop where you teach someone how to make a lamp or a dice tower with complicated pieces that you would put together, and you are intending on bringing the kit with you for them to help them put it together, you absolutely can sell that on your site. You can give them a link to your site, or you can give them a link to any site where they can purchase those materials, okay? Um, keep in mind that if they need to order them from you or someone else, that's a very tight turnaround. Um, I, we, we may be able to close registration early for some events, uh, if we have to, 
because of the length, that, the time that you would need to acquire the materials. But uh, generally, uh, we're just going to ask you to send them somewhere else to purchase those. So, the per so to be clear, if you're selling them the kit to make the event, that's going to be separate from the Gen Con event. The Gen Con event is just going to be two dollars, and the kit will be elsewhere. Whether you send them to Amazon or Joann's or some other third party, makes sense. Yeah, but just to, to cut in there on one sure. note on pricing, sure. um, if somebody if you're running a workshop and somebody needs to purchase a kit from you or from somebody else to participate in that workshop, um, you certainly don't want to build the cost of that kit into your ticket price from GenCon because they need to oh, go right. buy it separately. That's, um, however, yeah. mm -hmm. you are certainly welcome to include the cost of your time and your instruction in the GenCon. Oh, I'm sorry. Absolutely, absolutely. So. Uh, it, your skill it has value and yes you can absolutely charge extra for the fact that you're teaching them the skill whether it's a handicraft knitting sewing whether it's dancing sign language any any skill that you want to teach absolutely it has value and you can charge extra for that thank you so ultimately again if you are running an event and players all they need to do is just show up sign into their account in whatever platform you're going to use you're going to give them pre-gens, you're going to run the game, you're, they're ready to go, the materials are provided. If there's something that they need to do before they arrive, if they need to make a character, if they need to read the rule, like whatever else is going to happen, um, if they need to get supplies, the materials are not provided. And you should be ex extremely explicit in both your long description and the message to registered players about what they need to go get and how, how they need to build their character or what kind of material they need to get enough information for them to go do that on themselves and prepare. Um, a general piece of advice is I would still, like some of this may not be feasible for some online events, but the more you can do to adapt your event to function, even if people don't follow those instructions, the better. So that means that if you need, if you're gonna give, pre, or if you want players to make their own characters before they show up, um, prepare to have a couple players not do that and have some pre-gens on hand just in case. Uh, because then your event will go much smoother and you'll be able to accommodate people who didn't read the directions or signed up at the last minute um, without having to derail the event and delay it. All right. So just to that, like if your event didn't fill up, you can you, and you find someone that wants to play at the last minute, that's a great way to be able to yep. accommodate them. Yep. So the next field is attendee registration. Um, and this is uh, kind of a little bit different from what it is on site. Um, first, for almost every game, just leave it at yes. Um, that's a, a good default in almost every case. Because Gen Con Online has no generic tickets, because the tickets are electronic, they're all for specific events, do not select generic ticket only. It will not be accepted that way. It will be changed. Do not select that. Uh, there is no reason for that to happen uh, for Gen Con Online. However, invite only, just to clarify, that is not for someone to run an event that is private for them and their friends. If you know who you want to play with because you want to invite them, you can already go schedule a time to go play with them. You don't need Gen Con to be in the middle of that, whether at Gen Con or online. Uh, however, that invite only is more for um, tournaments where somebody needs to have beaten the previous tournament to get an invite to the current uh, tournament round that you're submitting or because this is a continuing story from one session to the next and you want to have the same players across multiple sessions for your RPG. You're going to do one session a day, let's say, and you want to have the same players continue the whole way through. In that case, the later two rounds being invite only makes perfect sense. Um, you'll just want to email us so we can adjust the price for the first round. Um, and like in a lot of cases, if you have an idea that doesn't seem to fit into this, this is one of those that feels that's better to reach out to us about. So like, for example, let's say that you wanted to run an event that shouldn't have any kind of ticket available to it. Um, there's a few examples where that might be appropriate. Um, you just want to let people know you're going to be doing it. Then you can submit the event, you can email us, and we can modify this field with some other options that you can't currently see. Yep. Don't select an Eric's only. This might uh, also, I'm sorry. Uh, no, this no. might also be a place to talk about, um, we'll talk about this more later, but you may be running a seminar on a Twitch platform or some other platform that is completely open to the public. 
so that there's no way that you can force them to get a Gen Con ticket. People can just show up to your Twitch channel. That's totally fine. Uh, we still want you to list it in the system if you'd like to run it at Gen Con online. And we would still like you to say, uh, yes, tickets are required because we would like people to still be able to, to purchase an electronic ticket, even though it's free, to just mm -hmm. keep account of how many people are interested. And it also, of course, gives them a reminder on their schedule as to they've registered for that event. So technically, you are right that they wouldn't need tickets for it. But we do ask you to go ahead, if you're doing it in the system, say, yes, they need tickets. So the the next field, the one that's actually very different from online, is platforms. And this used to basically be the location field for physical Gen Con. And the key thing here is that you are going to be able to just enter directly into this field what platform you are running your game on. And this is where you want to be very specific about what tools the player needs to connect to your game. We alluded to this before. So if you are running a uh, Roll20 game and you're using Roll20 for audio, video, um, battle map, all that kind of stuff, all they have to do is go Roll20 and sign in. Roll20 is the platform. If you're doing the same thing on Tabletopia, Tabletopia is the platform. But if you are going to mix things, if you're going to have a Zoom call or a Skype call or Google Meet or something like that, or Discord to do audio and video, and you're going to do just the battle map in Fantasy Grounds or Tabletop Simulator or something like that, then you'll want to list both because players will need to know they need both programs to participate. Uh, this is also, again, you know, if you are running um, an RPG through Zoom and you're going to use Fantasy Grounds on your local computer and you're going to control the map and just share your screen through Zoom and you don't want the players connecting to a Fantasy Grounds server to connect to you know, control the characters themselves, then you just need to list Zoom. You don't need to list Fantasy Grounds. This, um, we're probably going to edit this form a lot to standardize whatever people enter. But you need to just keep in mind, only enter what your players need to be running and connected to to participate in your event. Either of you have anything you want to add to that? Nope, I just reiterate too, if, uh, if part of somebody participating in those platforms is a requirement that they have a, a need to pay for a certain level of that account, make sure that that's outlined in both the long description and red message register players so that players know exactly that what they're signing up for, that they're not just, they don't just need the free version, that they might need a particular uh, subscription or, or license um, above that, that, that might have an additional cost. So then we get into preferred date and time. And this, you just want to enter, what time do you intend to run this game at? Um, uh, it's worth noting that for Gen Con Online, events have to start after noon or at noon or after on Thursday, and they must end by 8 p.m. on Sunday. So the times are a little shifted from the convention. Those times are also in Eastern time. So depending on where you are, um, that might dramatically change when you might be available to run games. Um, the show runs 24 hours once uh, noon starts on Thursday. So if you are all the way around the world and your players are all the way around the world, you want to run at 1 a.m. on a Friday, then give it a shot. Uh, event duration. This is where you specify how long the event will last. And the one note that we want to add here that we'll talk about a little bit when we get into running games is that you should assume that when playing a game online, when running a game online, it's going to take more time than normal. So you probably... It's going to vary based on game to game and what system you're doing and how complicated your setup is. So you need to kind of determine this yourself. But as a general rule of thumb, we want you to assume that it's going to take about 15 minutes for any registered players to connect, sort out technical problems, show up, sit down, like all the usual stuff that players have to do to get ready to play. So give them about 15 minutes to get situated. Then if you have any spots left that you didn't fill because uh, players didn't show up or tickets weren't sold, you want to take another 15 minutes or so to maybe try to find new players in the LFG group or something like that. If you want to, you can just start. But if you want to find more players, assume another 15 minutes or so. And then further, uh, especially if you and your players are not really um, used to playing a lot of games online, you probably want to assume or bet that it's going to take a lot longer to run the game than it normally would. 
it's a very weird thing. Sometimes online games are a lot more focused and faster. Sometimes they're a lot slower because communication back and forth between players can be a lot more difficult. I think the more talky that your game is and the more players that you have, the more likely your game is to take a lot longer than you normally would expect. So think about that when you're kind of planning your game. So in general, maybe consider just increasing the duration of your event by an hour over what you would normally do. Again, it's going to be based on games, going to vary a lot, but if you're normally going to run a four hour RPG, just plan on five hours just in case so that nobody's squished for time and you can kind of get through it at the appropriate pace. So consider that and consider doing that differently than a physical game there. Game masters, this is where you're going to enter the email addresses that your GMs use in our system. And just to clarify a couple of things, the GM is the person who is responsible for making this event happen. Um, could be the panelist for our seminar, could be the presenter for a workshop, could be the, you know, the DM for D&D or something like that. It's not always the person who submitted the event, because a lot of times if you have a group or a company, one person will submit everything like we've asked, and all, lots of other people will run the individual games. Um, there's a couple important things here. First, you have to enter the email address they used in our registration system for their account. If you enter an email that's not in their system, it will tell you it's not valid, it will remove it, and will give you the option to just submit again. If you're, the email address that your GM gave you doesn't seem to work, then they, it's not in our system. Um, and they may have a different email address, we may need to look up their account or something like that. That's a case where you probably just want to submit the event or save it for later and then email events at gencon.com um, or have the GM email customer service to kind of track down their account information. Or they can just go create an account under the email address that they want to use because if it's not on our system, then it's not on our system. Uh, if this is very important that you list who the GMs are, more important for GenCon Online than it would be for physical GenCon. Because for GenCon Online, the only people who can access that event messaging tool that we discussed are the players who have tickets to that event and the GMs who are listed on the event and the person who submitted the event, the event organizer. If you're not one of those three groups, you don't get access to the event tool. You won't be able to send out links to join or things like that. So that means that if the GMs for your organization change, you need to reach out to us to let us know so we can change that information in the system and list the appropriate person. Anything other of you want to add? Okay. Then we get to the message to registered players. Um, this is where you can go into even more detail if you need. Um, but specifically, this is going to be emailed to anybody who buys a ticket to your event and it will show up at the top of the event messaging tool. So this is where you want to put instructions your players need to follow to prepare them to participate. Again, do they need to make characters? Do they need to get supplies? Do they need to read certain rules? Do you want them to go watch a video? Um, because it's going to get them in the atmosphere and mood. Are you, you know, are you running Alien the RPG and you want them to go watch the trailer for Alien? Then link it here. Um, include those kinds of instructions here. Um, do not just reiterate the long description. Um, do not just say thanks, because um, then your players will get an email that just says thanks, and they won't really know uh, what you need them to do. Uh, so do not include the link to your session again, just like we said for the other fields. Um, you don't want to just say, click in this link, or here's the username and password. That's what the event messaging tool is for. This is an email that could be passed around and could be shared. So try to treat it reasonably securely, um, but definitely include any instructions you want them to do before they need to join. Anything else? Okay. The next two fields should also be pretty self-evident. There's the web address for information and the email for info. This is what URL and what email address do you want people to use if they have questions about your event. They want to learn more about the game. They want to learn more about your company and more about your group. Put the information here. I'm going to say it one more time. Do not put the link to your online session in this field because everyone can see it. Put the link to the game, to your company, to your personal website, something like that. A, uh, a YouTube video of you explaining it, whatever you kind of want to put it. Tournament details. This is a little bit complex. 
Um, so I would say that, A, if you want to run a tournament and our normal policies don't make a ton of sense and you have a question about it, then email us. We're happy to walk you through it. But fundamentally, um, if you're running a tournament, say yes. A tournament means, you know, is there competition for a prize? Is there a chance of elimination from those players? Then list it here. Uh, the tournament results of, you know, X of Y rounds and stuff like that, that's not necessarily how many rounds are you going to do in an individual session. It's how many separate submissions are making up your overall tournament structure. And this is where um, a small tournament of eight players or four players, you just submit as one. It's going to be around one of one. It's not going to be a big deal, especially like a non-elimination tournament, a Swiss tournament, a round robin tournament, where everyone's going to play all the way to the end. Those are almost always round one of one. It's elimination tournaments where you start with 256 players. And then after three hours, you're at 128. And then three more hours, you're at 64. And then three more hours, you're at 32. Each one of those cuts should be submitted as a different event. The initial event is the one that people can register for. And the later events are the ones that uh, are invite only, as we kind of discussed previously. Um, it's worth noting that the invite only rounds have no cost. So you can't charge for this. And then expected play time. This is just how long are people going to play before they have to get up. So then we have special requests. Um, just in general, if you have some sort of uh, need or something that you need to communicate about how your event is weird, it's different, um, it has to be handled in a certain way, um, you're flexible in the time, but you can't do this time, or you have to do one of these three times. Um, list that here, anything that you want Gen Con to know about your event that you don't need to communicate to players, you can list in this field. Um, Mary, do you have anything you want to talk about on that? Because I suspect that might come up a little more for workshops and seminars, maybe. I am not sure if it will in an online scenario, but I certainly uh, could be overlooking something. So yes, absolutely. If there's something wacky that uh, is associated with your event that we need to know about, We'll put it right there. That's going to go directly to us. That's not going to be something that attendees can see. So okay. just let us know. So then I think the final element of the form we need to talk about is pricing. So first, the Gen Con base price, as we discussed, for all events and in Gen Con online that would have a price, $2 is going to be the price. The form will still calculate $2 per increment of two hours, so a three or four hour event is going to have a $4, five, six, is going to have a $6 price, et cetera. We will have to manually adjust that ourselves during the review process. So you don't need to worry about that. You don't need to email us to tell us that there's a bug. We'll have to manually fix it. Don't worry about it unless it gets closer to, you know, if your event's active and the, pri the pricing is still wrong, definitely let us know. But if it's still being reviewed, don't need to worry about it yet. You can enter just about anything you want in this additional fee field. Okay, it has to be in increments of $2. So I could put in two for or 200, I guess, two, for example, here. That means that for every ticket, instead of $2, it's gonna cost $4. I'm gonna get $2, or you or whoever's submitting, I'm gonna get $2 for every player that you collect a ticket from, okay? Uh, you will need to enter your name for payment and the address that you want a check mailed to uh, unless you would like to contact us and set up direct deposit, which is a new functionality that we have. If you want information about direct deposit, enter your email address instead of your mailing address, and we will contact you to get you set up um, on the appropriate website and stuff like that. And, and on the direct deposit piece, as you can imagine, uh, there will be a certain level of you needing to supply additional banking information mm -hmm. within our, um, our direct deposit uh, company that we use. Um, in order to do that. So it does not just submit your email address and then never check your email again later. We won't be ha able to pay you um, if you don't uh, complete the process of actually filling out in the account um, that we'll invite you to set up. Um, and then that will enable us to do direct deposit. But until that process is completed, you, we will just be making attempts to contact you um, until that gets remedied. And that is the event submission form. Is there anything that we neglected to discuss? Very comprehensive. Um, no, I think that was very, very in-depth. Um, 
again, a lot of those fields are going to, for people who have submitted before, are going to sound very familiar. Um, we've commented through some of the specific tweaks and, um, and or things that we are asking you to additionally put in those fields to better uh, reflect your games in an online setting. Um, so just be, be cognizant of that. There are little um, I, info icons also on this form, and those have some additional information or little tips um, that we have there, and those are updated for Gen Con Online. So um, you can also click on those to see a little bit more of some of the, the basics, but as well as how some of these fields that uh, might be uh, used previously are gonna be used this for Gen Con Online, but we want a little bit more um, for, for an online event. So just, just be cognizant of that. And then as always, feel free to email us um, if you have questions um, and we'll do our best to, to help you through that process. And, and check the event host policy as well. The event host policy also has a breakdown of all the specific fields, specifically notifying the um, fields that are new, um, like the platform field, or that have a different functionality or a different purpose necessarily than what, what typically is done for just Gen Con at the physical convention. Uh, so just some additional resources there as you're figuring it out yourself. All right. <coughs> I think that if we are done with the submission form itself, why don't we uh, start talking about some of the best practices and kind of tips that we have figured out for running events online, as well as some of the tweaks to how that will be done for Gen Con Online in specific. So I'm gonna bring up our best practices page here. Um, and this is kind of a general set of tips and information for both event organizers and for attendees that you'll wanna keep in mind. and. This is just off of post and then in best practices for running or attending events online, if you need to refer to it later. It's also linked off of the host page itself. But to talk through some of that in particular, um, why don't we talk about the event messaging tool first? Um, yeah. Since I've been dominating this, Dominic, do you wanna uh, pick that up? Yeah, I can start there. So we've we've mentioned this event messaging tool a couple of times, um, acknowledging that its primary pur purpose is to to aid in uh, our event organizers and our registered attendees um, being able to communicate with each other so that they can actually get into the online session or event that they are hosting on a different platform. Um, so that is the primary purpose for this tool. Um, this is a new feature that's going to be added this year and will be available ahead of the convention, but obviously it's not going to be applicable until we have registered players for your event. So um, we're mm -hmm. still a month away before we will interact with that. I'm sure we'll be providing a little bit more information in the future as well to, to help people through this process. Mm -hmm. um, uh, basically, again, use this platform to communicate with your players to get them into the session. Um, so if that is that is where you want to have the direct links, um, this enables you to keep the privacy of your event, your event, and not letting outside people just um, free reign into links um, or, or joining into your sessions as you're going along. Um, do not use this for personal information or trying to uh, do additional sales or anything like this. Is This tool is intended to get you into your event with your, your full team. Do use it to help troubleshoot your players and, and walking them through um, logging in. So if you are, if you're one of your players is having difficulty getting into the uh, tabletop simulator um, version of your game that you've given them to, you can, this tool is there to help you walk them through that process. Um, and then, yeah, our, our anti-harassment policy applies here, just as it does on our forums and other online spaces, in the same way that it applies in the physical convention in all areas that Gen Con um, communicates and engages uh, the community during this process. If you have any issues, email um, events and customer service, and we will be able to step in and um, remove uh, people or messages that are um, breaking that, the terms of those policies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, I think we really want to emphasize that very, very heavily. Um, you are the event um, organizer. You're the person who is supervising this event. So if you see players harassing each other, if you see players harassing you, um, nobody deserves that and to any degree. Uh, report that to us as quickly as you can, and we will resolve it uh, as quickly and strongly as we can. Um, do you want to talk about how the event messaging tool will work at all? Like how you access it, things like that. Um, I, 
I can. Uh, the tool will be, is, like you said, is still not going to be, be accessible until after um, registered players have signed up for it. And it's really to be used in the run up, um, you know, the, the days or hours preceding your event is not intended to be an ongoing open communication um, device for, for everyone. Um, it is going to be linked to the event details. So if I've registered for mm -hmm. an event and I will see it in my schedule, um, I will be able to click on that event and it will pull up the event details. And from there, there will be a, a link to the event messaging tool. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the UI is, is still being built, but it will look similar and or function similar to our forum. So if you're just getting a sense of kind of what it will look like. Um, but again, it will only be the players um, who have registered for your event as well as the people you've listed as in the, G the game master field and then the individual who's the event organizer themselves. Um, so and that's it won't strictly where you'll see that located. Mm -hmm. It won't strictly be live, um, but it will be really like refreshed every few seconds. So it's pretty close. Yeah. But I think the, the important thing to remember is that the link to the event messaging tool will be on the event details page. So if you want to see who messaged you about a particular game, because you might have a lot of games that you've organized, um, just look up the game, go to the game, and you'll be able to see what messages are listed there. Yep. Um, and that's probably something to keep in mind that if you are an organization or a group that has a lot of games, you probably want to make individual GMs responsible for monitoring that leading up to the show to answer any questions or coordinate with any players um, immediately prior to, to running the event itself. So Marion, do you want to talk about how GMs are going to collect tickets for these events? I certainly can. They are going to, again, go to the event details page, uh, which Dominic talked about. You can uh, just look up the event and click on it. Not a problem. And there's going to be a little uh, radio button, I believe. They're still working on it, but just a little radio button that will say, give ticket to event host. That's exactly what the wording will be. Uh, when you are ready and you're ready to play your event and you're there and you're good to go, you're going to click on that, that radio button. It will whatever fill in, I suppose. And then you will be checked in for that game. Mm -hmm. The GM. So that's what the, that's what the oh, player sorry. does. When the that's player's the player ready to turn the ticket. Mm -hmm. That's a player. So then when the after the player does that, the GM will be able to confirm that they have checked in. And I'm not sure what we're calling that button. Uh, so it's not a button. Like, yep. The, ahead, the, this is basically the, the collecting tickets portion of this. So because yes, it is we skipped. Um, electronic, um, there's no physical handing off of tickets right. and turning them back into us. Once the attendee has clicked the give ticket to event host, the um, event host and GM will be able to see on the tickets field that um, that ticket has been reconciled. It will say redeemed or, or some sort of completed process. The status will change for that player's um, ticket. Um, so if you check that and you have four four of your five players who've gotten into your game, um, but only, uh, or you've gotten all five players in your game, but you look at that the list and only four of them say redeemed, that one person still hasn't turned in their ticket, you want to com communicate to that player, uh, please click on the give ticket to event host to confirm, and that way we can begin our game um, so that you have actually checked into to the event. Um, that's, that's kind of the process of, of how we're navigating this in an online world, um, acknowledging the fact that it's important to keep track of attendance, um, as well mm -hmm. as this is the way you're going to get credit for the players who have showed up. It is, uh, mm -hmm. we just like with a physical convention, you are get, receive credit for um, tickets that have been turned in um, in this process, tickets that have been redeemed. Um, and that, that process is the same um, as the online convention. So. Um, we don't we don't pay out for every single ticket that is sold. It is only the, the tickets that have been redeemed or turned in. Mm -hmm. And it is worth noting that um, these are electronic tickets to specific events. So again, there's no generics. There's no need for generics. It also means there's no uh, you can't take a ticket for one event and use it at a different event. Um, if you decide you want to play a different game, just go buy the ticket to that game. If that game was sold out the GM will have the ability to add a ticket to your cart um, to fill any spots for no-shows or anything like that. If they need to kind of effectively oversell an event. Um, but it's very important that you give the GM credit so that we know when we're planning for the future, 
uh, how many people actually played in any, any given game so that we know where to kind of focus our attention in the recruitment. Uh, it's also okay. worth noting that the only the recipient, only the ticket holder is going to be able to turn in the tickets. Uh -huh. So if Marion bought a ticket for Dominic and I and herself to go play an RPG, each of us have to turn in our own ticket. She cannot turn in tickets on our behalf. You're going to say something, Dominic? No, that, that was what I was going to lead to, that, that, that that's the important piece, too. Players are checking them, themselves in. So if, in Derek's example, if only, uh, only Marion and I showed up and we were the only ones who checked in, um, we can't also check Derek in. Derek's not there to check himself in. He did not participate. Mm -hmm. He's not going to – that ticket's not going to be redeemed. Mm -hmm. The last and, thing to and, know, and just okay. like the event messaging tool, this some of this stuff is still being um, flushed out. So we will certainly yeah. be sending more information and clarification um, in the run up to this. But a lot of these features you won't be able to even uh, begin to work with until uh, event registration begins in mid July. So um, yep, we, there will be more information coming on all these components. Yeah, I was about to say we do intend to have more videos and streams that go into more detail about individual tools, individual platforms, things like that. So if there are any elements that anybody has any questions about, please let us know so that we know that we need to revisit it and go into more detail so that people will be comfortable with what to expect. The final thing that I, I think we want to say about tickets that's a little bit of a departure from the physical show is that you will only be able to get one ticket under any individual account or name. So historically, you've been able to buy two tickets under your own name uh, for most games. For some games like True Dungeon or for D&D &D or something like that, you might be able to buy a whole table's worth under your own name because you don't know which of your friends are gonna show up. Since these are electronic tickets and they're for specific games and for specific people, you can only buy one ticket per name. You can still buy a whole table of D&D &D or something like that. You just have to make sure that you have linked your friends' accounts properly um, and that you have set that up before you attempt to go buy those tickets on July 13th. So um, if you like to play with your friends and you want to keep doing that, you absolutely can. Just set up your account properly. And one person can still buy tickets for everybody. They just need to be linked with those accounts. So then finally, um, let's talk about running games online. Um, and we just kind of have a few general tips that we want to give. Um, some of them are actually pretty specific. Some of them are very general. Um, beyond like, just go do this yourself, go practice, play a couple games with your friends, get used to it. Um, you know, remember what it was like when you first started playing board games or role playing games or things like that. It was a little bit awkward. Um, it's gonna be the same way if you wait until the last minute and then your Gen Con online game is the first time you've turned on your webcam. Um, so a few things, one, um, make sure that you have installed your software you intend to use, make sure it's updated, make sure your webcam works, um, all that kind of stuff. Make sure your hardware is actually working before you're supposed to go run it for your players. Because if you need to install Windows Update right when you're gonna run your game, it's gonna be a bad time for everybody. Um, but first, just be like the most important piece of advice, be patient with yourself and your players and your equipment. Um, I kind of alluded to this when I was talking about um, extending the event duration, but uh, a lot of players are not going to be used to these tools. You may not be used to these tools. It's not going to be as smooth as you feel just sitting down at the table and cracking the book um, or opening the box is going to be, but it's still a game. You're still going to love it. Just be patient. Um, talk to people, give people the benefit of the doubt and don't get yourself stressed out. If you need to be like, Hey players, I'm having a technical problem. Give me five minutes. Like just communicate with people. They can go get a soda or something or come back. Um, they're in their house. You know, they can lounge around in their pajamas while they're, they're waiting for you to figure it out. Um, but just stay calm and, and patient. Uh, we talked about how running games online takes longer than usual or may take longer than usual. So just, again, to reiterate that, you probably want to plan a 13-minute window. or I'm sorry, 15-minute window. Very specific. Um, yeah, I don't yeah. know. Uh, yeah, a 15-minute window to deal with technical problems, um, connection issues, players being late, having questions, things like that. And then if you still have space in your game, plan for another 15 minutes of trying to recruit players from the LFG channel and Discord or something like that. And then going through the same connection problems that you had with the players who had tickets to the event in the first place. Um, you want to kind of like walk through that process, basically. Uh, and then again, I think in my experience, the more people 
the game has, the more those people talk, the longer the game is going to take. So if you're running a six player RPG, that's very, very talk um, intensive, it's going to take longer. If you're running a two player RPG that maybe is more quiet and contemplative, it, it may not take as, uh, as, as longer of a window, but consider maybe just padding your duration out by an hour just in case in a lot of cases. Anything other of you want to say about games that you may have played online? No? No, I, I think that sentiment is, is, is correct, though, is that this process is going to be new for everybody. Um, we suggest giving uh, adding to your duration so that you're giving yourselves every be uh, best opportunity to successfully run the game um, with your attendees, acknowledging the fact that there's going to be bumps in the road along the way, and you'll be needing to use some of that time to, to clean things up. So just really, really reiterating that. And um, we have some suggestions there, but you're going to need to make those decisions on on what you need for your event and giving yourself some additional time um, to troubleshoot. So. I'm still thinking about us all playing an RPG together. That'd be fun. Um, yeah, I mean, my, uh, you know, you said be familiar with it. I mean, you can, you can run a test game. You can run a sample game with your friends. If you're, if you are unfamiliar with the platform or if you want to test out a few platforms, please do that. Don't be the first time that you ever actually run a game, your scheduled Gen Con event because I guarantee you it, it, it's probably going to be there's probably going to be technical issues there's probably going to be a wonky feature that you you don't understand so if, if at all possible run a few events uh, or run a few games in this in the platform of your choice before you run your Gen Con event. Great point. Great um, so I have some advice about like specific hardware and stuff just talk about like, equipment that you might want to get. Most of these things are not strictly required based on the event that you have. Like technically, you can play games without an audio connection. You can play games without a video connection. You don't have to see the other players for a lot of these games. I do recommend it. I think that in most cases, you're gonna have more fun if you can see the players that you're, you're playing with. But especially if you're working with older machines and things like that, you know, we don't want to exclude players who may not have current phones or uh, you know, current laptops or anything like that. So um, when you're running your event, you do want to specify what you're going to bring to it. You know, uh, if you're not going to have audio, then you probably want to let people know that so they know that it's going to be entirely text-based because that may be something that some folks aren't interested in. Um, and if you're not going to have video, you probably want to mention that too, just so that folks know they may not be able to see you because again, you might have some folks who are not interested in that. But you probably want to do a couple things. Avoid using your built-in webcam and your built-in microphone if you can afford to do so. Um, if you have an external one, use it because it's almost guaranteed to be better than what's built in. Um, however, webcams are really difficult to find these days. Uh, a lot of them are very, very expensive. So you might want to explore other alternatives and options. Uh, Marion uh, is showing off a webcam that she has there. Um, but like, for example, right now I'm filming off of my iPhone that I have managed to figure out a process to turn it into a webcam for my computer to use. That may not be a thing that everybody wants to leap into and try to enjoy or experiment with. But if you do like to tinker with things, and I know that a lot of gamers do like technology, um, try to get an external system working because it's almost always better than what's built into your computer. And importantly, um, Use headphones uh, so that there's no chance of feedback between what's coming out of your computer and what your microphone is picking up. Um, and uh, if you have lots of players in your group, you have lots of people in the game, consider either asking them to manually mute and unmute when they, uh, it's not their turn, when they're not talking, when they're not in the scene, just to help keep things focused and eliminate background noise. Um, or consider, depending on the platform, enabling push to talk. Um, that's a detail that you'll get into if you're playing on Discord or, or other things, but consider those elements. And those things are more and more important the more players you have. When you start, my experience, when you start getting past like four players, when you get up to like five or six players, you really want to consider kind of implementing some table rules. Um, you know, maybe you will have a, if you're in Discord, have a text channel where people can talk with each other. They can share jokes. They can crack, like they can do the table talk that would normally happen out in the open, 
and you can have the video and audio channel focused on playing the game and people can kind of rotate whose turn it is and stuff like that. Consider those kinds of things, basically. Um, um, I think that's good, Derek. I just okay. wanted to add one thing to that. Um, mm -hmm. I just showed you a cool webcam that I have and I just showed you a cool microphone that I have and we couldn't get the microphone to work. So mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, it's great to have these devices. It's also good to have a backup so that yep. if your microphone and your camera don't work, you do have one maybe in your laptop or another spare computer. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that it's a good idea to have backups if possible be ready to run it in a different manner mm -hmm. you have to with different equipment it's always it's always good to have redundant equipment yep uh, chances are if you have a smartphone you do have a backup for both of those things <clears throat> because most of the platforms that we might use to connect uh, zoom or discord or whatever else um, you could okay. use your laptop to connect to the roll 20 board you could connect to the tabletopia session um, you're connecting that through the laptop but then you can just set your camera or your phone nearby and connect to the zoom call or the discord call or whatever else to talk to people we've had you know some players in our online games who've had to do stuff like that in the past uh, additionally um, this might get a little more complex or detailed uh, for some people but if you're setting up a webcam put the light behind the webcam facing you do not put the light behind you facing the webcam um, if you just going to make yourself look better. If you put it behind you and you can't see anything, it's just bright. Um, so all my lights, my major lights are on the other side of the camera, which is why I look okay right now. I have actually a three point lighting system set up here right now for other reasons, but I thought I would do the stream on this just, just so you could see uh, how awesome lighting is. Uh, and I'm going to guess that Dominic um, has fine lighting but the least lighting of all of us probably today. Mm -hmm. uh, so it does kind of make a difference. Yep, but um, he's also not in a dark room, which also helps. But it's, I mean, it depends, of course, if you're running a Cthulhu game, maybe maybe that's what you need, you know? There's, there's, a, there's a lot of different levels that you can take uh, depending yep. on your resources <laughs> and your um, desire to to how you want to present yourself during, during these mm -hmm. um, events. Just something to be mindful of um, as you're going about it. There's some small things you could do to, to improve the quality of your event and the experience your attendees are going to have. Great. Uh, and I think that's about it for our current tips for running events. I do want to let everybody know that we will have, again, additional streams to talk about specific platforms, specific tools. So if you have heard about Roll20 and you really want to know how it works, we will have a video that explains that. But now you can also just go to Roll20's website and they have a wealth of videos to train you. Like uh, all of the platforms that we um, will kind of give you an overview have their own training materials you can go look at now, um, or you can wait for a little bit of maybe an intro beginner outside view that we'll produce later. So why don't we maybe kind of step back from the website um, and uh, just talk about how to room submit a couple different sample standard events like things you might want to keep in mind um marion do you want to maybe talk about uh, a seminar or a workshop and how you'd like to see you know what tips you would give for somebody to submit the things they need to keep in mind um uh, a lot of it's going to be somewhat similar to how you would submit it uh mm -hmm. on it, it all for any regular gen con um uh, something that i'm not 100 percent sure if we we did sort of touch on this, I think, but I, I, I want to mm -hmm. say it again, you know, you can run on Twitch, you can run, you can run it on YouTube, you can run it on Facebook Live, you can run it on any kind of live stream platform, even though there's no way that we can restrict access to Gen Con attendees only, and that's totally fine. Um, mm -hmm. We will have our own Twitch, but that's already uh, pretty tightly packed, and it's very unlikely that we can accommodate any of your events on our Twitch. So it's, and it's free for anyone to get a Twitch account. This could be a great time for you to start your Twitch career. Um, mm -hmm. I uh, am very open to a large variety of seminars. Um, just make sure, um, even though it's gonna be open to everyone, please don't put the link to it in your actual event. Um, put it in the event messaging tool when that goes live. Uh, and, and just as you would for any seminar, uh, I, I want to make sure that people will understand exactly what they're talking about. You're trying to hook people. You're trying to get them excited and interested in your seminar. So, so please have the description reflect that. 
for your maximum players, just because you're running in a, a large, you could potentially have a large audience. I don't want you to put 999. I please don't put unlimited. That makes me sad. Uh, I want you to give your best estimate of what you think your max attendance will be. Um, keeping in mind that seminars at Gen Con don't normally run over a hundred attendees, but of course this is online. So who knows? Mm -hmm. And I am absolutely able to increase it. Should your event be sell out, even though it's free online, happy to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so to maybe just talk through another couple other examples. Um, let's just say that you wanted to run a simple RPG session. You want, to run D D for five players, I used Tomb of Horrors before, uh, so let's just use it again. I'm going to run Tomb of Horrors. Um, it's going to be in you know first edition D D because I want to go visit the past uh, and hurt. So um, we're going to just so you know you're going to fill out the form. Tomb of Horrors is going to be the title. Derek's pretty good gaming group is going to maybe be the the group name if I'm going to you know recruit Dominic to run some games kind of under the banner too. Um, you know the description is going to be. You know, like grab your sword and come explore the the dungeon that kills every adventurer who comes into it. Um, the long description might be like, hey, make your own first level characters. We're going to throw them in the Tomb of Horrors and see how long they last. Um, you know, maybe the advice would be make five first level characters because I'm going to kill the first four in like the first 30 minutes or something like that. Um, the minimum number of players, let's say three. Maximum number of players, five. Uh and, you know, I want it to be a five-hour session because normally it would probably take me four hours to do this. Um, and, you know, submit that event. Uh, you know, maybe I want to charge a little bit more money when I add $2. So the ticket prices are going to be $4 per player. Um, that's the event that uh, I'm going to run. That's kind of most of the information that I need to put in. The game system would be Dungeons & Dragons. The rules edition would be, you know, uh, like first edition for example, maybe it's the very first edition, or if I want to do AD and D first edition, I would do uh, game system of Dungeons and Dragons. The rules edition would be advanced first, and that's a straight up simple RPG. Um, similarly, a board game. You know, I talked about, gave a couple examples before. Um, you know, let's go with Scythe. I like Scythe. Uh, I'm going to submit a game of Scythe. The event title probably just going to be Scythe, or maybe it will be Scythe. Um, uh, Explorers from Afar, I think, is what it's called, the expansion. Um, and, you know, it's letting people know that those factions will be in play. It's going to be for four players. Uh, you know, I'm going to put Scythe uh, first edition in there because there hasn't been a new edition of it. Or if I'm playing Invaders from Afar, then Invaders from Afar is the rules edition because it's an expansion that changes the rules a little bit. Uh, if I was playing the Fenris campaign, um, that could be an expansion in there. Um, you know, I don't recall if some of those options are available online right now, but that's the basic idea. Like you should get kind of what we're getting at with some of those very, very basic games. Um, you know, if any of those are going to continue multiple sessions, you just put session one out of three in the title. Um, you know, in the description, you can exp you know list when you're going to run the other sessions and things like that. Um, I think we talked about a couple of the things like continuing stories and whatnot. Um, when we were talking about pricing and things like that, we talked about tournaments. Um, I think the last thing that we might want to talk about as kind of a special case for events is if you intend to stream your, uh, your game to Twitch, um, as opposed to your seminar, for example, um, it's a little bit different if you need to use our registration system to recruit the people who are going to be on camera during that stream. So if you're seminar is going to go on Twitch. You can just submit it as one event. It's your seminar. People just need to get a ticket to view it. But if you want to play that Tomb of Horrors game and you want to stream it to Twitch and you want players to have a chance to buy a ticket to play, you know, maybe you're already a streamer and you want to engage with your community and stream that game or something like that, then what you're going to want to do is list two different events. One of them is going to be the board game that's, you know, uh, or RPG or whatever it's going to be. The game people will get a ticket to buy to sit at the table and play on camera. Um, and that's going to be submitted just like any other kind of um, at the table event. And then you're going to have a second event that's going to be the online session, probably an entertainment event, ENT event. And that's going to be the one that's listed as being on Twitch. Um, it's going to have 200, 300, 500 tickets available for it based on your anticipated audience. 
that's probably going to be free. Um, that's the one your audience will get a ticket to to remind them to go watch it. But that's different from the ticket for for playing in the game itself. Anything either of you two want to add to that? No, I, I think that that covers it. I, I think we um, will we we really encourage people who are doing other activities that are um, presentations in a public platform, put it in the event submission. Um, and uh, if you have any question about the viability or how you should set it up, um, let us know. Uh, we'll be catching a lot of that during event review. Um, but please, you know, reach out to us and let us know. That, if you need further explanation or even better use the special request field to explain some of that um, so that you can communicate with us a little bit more in detail about the uni uniqueness of the event that you're running um, or event you're submitting um, in the system. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, it really boils down to uh, if you're doing anything during that Gen Con weekend that you want to be part of Gen Con that you want to get more attention to, then it should be listed in the registration system. And there's probably a way to do it. And if it doesn't immediately occur to you, um, if you're not sure, uh, if you feel like it straddles the line between multiple event types or something like that, then just reach out to us and we're happy to talk through it and figure out what the best approach might be. So then finally, why don't we look at another web page we have that is third-party platforms. So we'll just go through this very quickly because you know, as we mentioned, we have uh, other videos planned um, where we will cover uh, the details of these platforms, both from the perspective of how to run games on them, but also how to play games on them so that players know kind of what they're getting into when they decide they want to sign up for a particular game or not. So, Marion, you did a lot of the research on this one. Um, do you want to start with maybe talking about what some of the general audio video chat platforms are and what people might want to use them for? Um, absolutely. Uh, you can use a general audio video chat platform for just a regular seminar or a workshop. Uh, you can also use it, and I think Derek has touched on this, uh, in conjunction with something else. So um, if you are playing a board game on Tabletopia and you want to use Zoom for your, your video and audio, you can, you can absolutely do that. So uh, these uh, can be really for almost any kind of game. I mean, you can also just run a run a Dungeons and Dragons game on this, you know, and, and like I said, point the camera at the, the player board and, and you can have a dice bot or just trust the players to roll. I mean, really, they're very versatile. They're just a way for you to connect audio and, and video with all of your other players, just like you would if you were sitting at a regular table. Mm -hmm. Um. Should we go over just a few of these? Sure. Well, I mean, why, yeah. Why don't you just list through and like, um, you know, like, like as you've mentioned, I think in your in your research, almost all of these have some sort of free option. It's both for the presenter want? and the user, but they have yeah. different limitations, and people will need to kind of research and figure out which platform is going to work best for them in terms of tools that it provides, maximum number of people that it can accommodate, maximum duration it can run, and things like that. Right. We, we've included a little bit of info here. Um, I think in the end, it, it may for you come down to what you're more familiar with. Um, I certainly encourage you to take a look at some of these options. Uh, so just an, as an example, you might be most familiar with Zoom. And so you're just comfortable with that. But I absolutely encourage you to look at some of these other programs. They might have features that you prefer. Uh, they might just feel easier for you to use. You might prefer the look of them. Uh, so uh, all of these, I believe, um, yes, have a free option. Um, some of them you don't even need a login for, uh, but I would encourage you just to take a few minutes to look at all of them. Um, I spent a fair amount of time looking at these, and these were the best options that I found during my research, but that's it's by no means exclusive. Uh, so if you find another uh, great audio video platform that you want to use, absolutely submit it. Um, and, and, and we'll take a look at it and it's probably fine. But these all have free options that I think would work well um, for a Gen Con event. Mm -hmm. So the, the, audio, the audio video programs that you looked at that you thought were kind of the, the best to choose were Zoom, mm -hmm. Cisco WebEx, yep. Google Meet, Go mm -hmm. Brunch, which I believe you said was particularly good for presenters and seminars and stuff like that. 
I thought so. Yes. And then it's a, it's for, not well known, but it mm -hmm. consistently came up on a list of top five or top 10 free uh, audio video platforms. I took a look at it. It's kind of fun. Give it a look. And then Discord is kind of uh, an old uh, reliable for yep. the gaming community. It's for audio video chat online. There are a lot of dice bots and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. Discord is one of those things that I think you can dive into to the extent you want to. Uh, you could make your own server. You could add bots to it. You could add functionality to it. You could also just use it to just direct message your players and set up a call. Um, you and, can kind of do whatever degree you want. And just and just to clarify the Discord, um, Derek also briefly touched on this. There, there will be a specific Gen Con Discord. Mm -hmm. uh, you will not be able to run your event on that. Uh, you will be able to use that to say, look for new players to add to your event. Uh, you'll want to maybe set up your own server for Discord. Um, or use direct messaging or I, however you want to do that. Um, mm -hmm. But you're not, we're, Gen Con's not going to be providing a third party platform for you to play the game on. That, that's up to you to, uh, you to find or create or however. Well, speaking, speaking of third party platforms, okay. um, I think the, there's two broad categories of platforms that we identified. Um, and this is a list of resources that we're familiar with. Again, you might have a different system yeah. um, that you want to use that you're more comfortable with. You're welcome to do so. Um, if you want to bring something to our attention, you're welcome to do so. But for RPGs, uh, actually, I'm sorry, um, for platforms in general, there appears to be kind of two general business models. One is you buy a license, um, a one-time license, you get access to the tools. You know, if a major update happens, you buy a new license. Uh, the other one is a subscription-based where a lot of times it's almost like a Netflix thing. You can play as many games or as many types of games as you want, but you have to maintain your subscription to access them. Um, and there's, you know, a variety of different approaches kind of in between mixing the two of them. But for RPGs, there were four large platforms that we identified that you probably want to check out. Um, if you want something that is entirely web-based, that, um, you know, uh, will usually have a subscription of some kind for some tools, or you might be able to buy some individual components, but does have a general free baseline. You want to look at Roll20 and Astral Tabletop is a newer one that's out. Uh, I believe they have a close relationship with Drive Through RPG, which a lot of people are probably familiar with. Yeah, they do have some sort of arrangement. Yeah. The other prominent tools are Fantasy Grounds, which is an application you install on your computer, and D20 Pro, which I believe has both a computer installation and some online components. Um, but both of those have one-time licenses. D20 Pro, I believe, also has a license to allow you to, um, to get, I think both of them actually um, well, have a license that allows you to get multiple players in without yeah. them having to also purchase licenses. Um, so right, they, the, they have a premium subscription for you, mm -hmm. like you can be a pro GM, but you can also buy specific modules, should you choose to. Um, they don't really have a, a subscription, I don't, no they don't, where you pay and you have access to all the content that they have. So a lot of the content you do have to buy piecemeal for them, but mm -hmm. that I, they still have a, a good bit of content. So then and, for board, or, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, uh, Roll20 is uh, system agnostic, which is really nice because you can uh, even run a homebrew game in there, you know, just create your own. Two. Yeah. Formulas. I mean, a lot of them do that, but that's to just... clarify, like all these platforms can do that. Um, yeah. they, they, they all can run relatively agnostic. A lot of them have some very basic D20 functionality in them. Mm -hmm. Um, that's relatively generic. Um, I believe they all also have specific rule sets that you can buy to automate things, character sheets that will roll for you. Um, you know, some of them will have dynamic lighting and they can control the battle. Like there's a lot of tools and options and bells and whistles that you can get into if that's the thing that you want to do. Um, but if you're also just kind of old school and you just want the simplest uh, experience you can get, a lot of these will offer that too. So for board and card game platforms, there were three that we wanted to highlight. There's Tabletop Simulator. That is an application you uh, get from Steam. Um, you buy the license for that as a one-time fee. There's a lot of user-generated content that you can use, a lot of user-adapted games that are in there through the Steam Workshop. But there's also official games that you can just buy again for one-time fee. Um, and then everybody can play. Um, the other approaches uh, for Tabletopia and Board Game Arena are subscription services where there's multiple tiers of subscription um, and including a level where you can have your subscription that you pay for maybe as the GM 
and your players can join in your game for free. Um, but they also have free tiers that you can play, you know, a limited subset of games or uh, fewer players or, you know, modified versions of games and things like that. Um, so again, those are Tabletop Simulator, Tabletopia, and Board Game Arena. So those are the general platforms that we recommend that you check out if you are not sure or not used to or exploring and you want to kind of take the leap to something online. If you've already found one that you like, um, whether it's on this list or not, stick with it, play it, submit it. Um, chances are you'll find somebody else who also uses it who might want to play something with you. So don't feel like you have to cleave to this list. This is a starting point for people to use to determine what is going to best match their needs and preferences, basically. And if you come across something amazing and it's not on this list, let us know and maybe we'll yeah. add it. And, and to pick up on, on that point, the, the, you know, part of, part of, part of your research in deciding how you're going to run your event is what platform is going to be on. It's going to be one of the very key components of this and making your event mm -hmm. online. Like do you, do your research in advance and submit your event as you will intend to run it. Um, how you list the platforms you're going to use should be the platforms you're going to end up being, end up using for Gen Con online. Um, because attendees are also going to be doing their research when they are seeing events as they are submitted and making sure that they are choosing platforms that they or they're choosing events that are on platforms that they are comfortable with or that they want to try out um, or they they might be familiar with. Like they're going to be doing their own research in that process. So you won't have the opportunity to really change things up down the road. So you need to do that research up front um, before you go into event submission um, so that you've, you've got a game plan fully flushed out when you go to submit your event. Uh, and that, mm -hmm. that is the plan you're going to follow through on because um, that's, that's that back and forth between the event host and attendee that's going to be really, really crucial in this component where we are opening up uh, this exciting opportunity to have online events um, during the convention. So it's it's a big uh, playground that we are opening up that is brand new to, to Gen Con um, and to how we proceed with the convention. Um, it's also a brand new uh, opportunity for people to try out a lot of new things and, and explore uh, different options. So just do your research up front. That's, that's what we all need to do to, to pull this off and we'll help limit as many, um, many, many points of confusion or frustration as we can possibly do. Yeah, I think it's important to keep that kind of sentiment in mind, is that um, we're very sad that we're, it's not safe, it's not appropriate or responsible to have a convention physically in Indianapolis this year. Um, but at the same time, uh, I'm very excited that, about this opportunity to let people who would normally not participate at Gen Con um, have a chance to do so. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that there will be um, a lot of players who have not been able to attend Gen, Gen Con in the past due to money or the inability to travel or, um, uh, you know, maybe they don't speak English or anything like that. Um, I would love for a lot of them to find a place to play games in a Gen Con online. So it's going to be a lot of work for a lot of us to figure out how to play these games online and how to be comfortable playing these games online. But keep in mind that a lot of your friends probably already are playing these games online, either because they took the leap during the quarantine in the U.S. or around the world, or because they've always been playing these games online, um, you know, for, for as long as they could, basically. So reach out to them, um, try out some games, see what feels comfortable and familiar, like take the plunge and learn something new if you haven't already. And if you have been playing games a lot online, and all of this advice that we're trying to give you here uh, is common knowledge to you and you've been practicing it for a long time, then take the opportunity to share that with your friends. Uh, go to the Gen Con forums and share it with other Gen Con attendees. There's a couple of threads we have where folks are kind of trading best practices and tips and advice and their experience with online platforms. So share your knowledge and seek out the knowledge other people have so that we can take Gen Con online and we can still get some of that experience and we can share that with other people who have not been able to to participate in the past. And that is a long way to say, uh, this is how you submit events. Uh, it seems complicated, uh, mainly because, you know, like, think of it this way. It's it the event submission bit. process is not complex for the individual game you wanna submit. The only reason that it took us this long to get through it is because Gen Con is a place where just about any game has a place 
and you know any gaming event has a place and there are so many different kinds of games and events and players and ideas and sizes and variables that it takes a long time for us to kind of work through everything that might apply to you but again if you're just wanting to run a couple games of something it's not that hard i really really encourage you to do it um you deciding to take the plunge to be like fine i'm just gonna run seven wonders i'm just gonna see how it goes Try it a couple of times, run it for Gen Con Online. You taking that plunge might enable the other three or four other players who are going to join you to be like, you know what, I'm going to take the plunge to learn how to play. And then they're going to teach their friends how to play and we can all get back online playing games until we can actually go somewhere together and play them again. I'm really excited to see uh, some innovative ways that people come up with mm -hmm. to run their games. Um, we talked about LARPs before, but even for RPGs, I. I think it's going to be really fun, really interesting. And mm -hmm. I, yeah, I am sad we can't go in game in person, but I still think we're all going to have a great time. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Do you have anything uh, uplifting and sunshiny to share with our audience? <laughs> well, I think I, I think I pivoted that a little bit right. already. Um, Smiley but, face. Yeah, you know, this is an exciting new opportunity. Um, <laughs> it's going to present uh, a whole new level of creativity that you, you can explore. Um, and we encourage people to be creative and innovative, like Marion says. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing a whole different suite of event submissions that we don't normally see or ways that people are describing their events and that is new to us. It's going to be new on our end as well. Um, so we're excited about this opportunity. We hope people take us up on this to, to submit their events and, and participate in Gen Con Online in this way. Um, Reed, uh, I, I just... Overall, just read um, the material that we've provided on the website, on the host page, um, and mm -hmm. those documents that we've walked through today. Make sure you read through the EHP that's been updated specifically for Gen Con Online, and a lot of the things that we talked about in here um, are in detail and text in that, that document. Um, and then, yeah, keep, uh, keep attentive to deadlines and um, your follow-up on your events as they go through the process of being submitted to um, ultimately being played um, in the end of July and early August. So that is kind of really all I, I really want to say. Again, always, if, if you have any questions too about your, your game or you need, need more clarification on something, um, email us um, or check out the forums. Like those are the two best ways to, to get more information from the community and, and we'll be answering as speedily as we can. Mm -hmm. Yep, events at GenCon.com or visit our forums. Um, if you had a question, reach out. I hope we answered most things. We will have more information and more specific information coming out later. Um, and again, uh, let us know what else you'd like us to cover. And we hope that we will see you at Gen Con Online.